welcome everybody to Wisdom from Our Neighborhood. Wisdom from Our Neighborhood is, uh, is sponsored by Paths to Understanding, which is formerly Neighbors in Faith and the Tracy Levine Center. Our mission is bridging bias and building unity through multi-faith peacemaking. Um, we do that through inspiring stories, nurturing relationships, and acting together. My name is Terry Kylo. I'm the Executive Director of Paths to Understanding. I live here in Anacortes. I'm also a part of, of a group in Anacortes called the, um, the uh, Inclusion, Diversity, and Equity in Anacortes group. And tonight I'm joined by a number of other members of the group tonight in a conversation about uh, racism in small towns. This will be the second in this series, and we're happy to have all of you join us today. If you have any questions you'd like to share, if you're watching on Zoom, you can sure use the, the Q&A feature. If you're watching on Facebook, feel free to list any questions you have in the comment section of Facebook Live, and we'll be really happy to, uh, to pick those up and incorporate those later on in the conversation. Um, but first, I just want to introduce some folk. Uh, first of all, Kate Clark is an artist and educator who develops public art projects about social histories we avoid and a larger, more complex story that, we might, that might light our future. Kate, thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me. We also have today Anthony Young, um, who is uh, on, serves on the Anacortes City Council and uh, is one of the founders of the, uh, the IDEA group in Anacortes. Uh, Anthony, w welcome and thanks for being here. Thank you for having me. And then next we have Keiko McCracken, who, who serves as the Community Engagement Coordinator for the Anacortes School District and a longtime resident of Anacortes. Keiko, thanks for being here. Terry, thanks for having me. So I was the Community Engagement Coordinator and now I... Uh, serve in the special ed department. And I just want to uh, make sure everybody um, understands that uh, the views I express here are my own and I'm not representing the school district in this, in this podcast. Thanks for that correction, Keiko. And, uh, and, and, and we'll all take your, your disclaimer, uh, you know, uh, seriously <laughs> and well. Um, and lastly, we have Leslie Eastwood, who's the general manager of the Samish Indian Nation and is a Samish tribal citizen. Um, Leslie, welcome for being, welcome and thanks for being here. It's my pleasure, Terry, to join. And I would also echo what Keiko said in terms of my participation here is not officially in my role as general manager. It's mostly being a Samish citizen. I've lived here in Anacortes for over 20 years. My ancestors have been here since time immemorial. And I'm raising a native child in the district. So the, those are all really the, the important points about why I'm, I'm eager to participate. Thank you. Thank you, Leslie. We're so glad you're with us. So we've now had, I think, five or six weeks of public demonstrations in Anacortes, and we just want to begin our conversation tonight by kind of giving people a brief overview. And Anthony, I'd like to start with you, if I could, about what work is being done to address issues of equity and diversity in Anacortes right now. You know, thank you, Terry. Well, it's, it's been an awesome journey, I can tell you that, um, starting with a wonderful town, but a town that had um, needed to have this conversation, obviously, for a long time. So some of the wonderful stuff that's come out of, as a result of the Black Lives Matter protest movements, the uh, anti-racism groups are being formed. We have the Cultural Coalition, which tethers together diverse people, Asian background, Native background, African American, Caucasian background, you know, um, Indian background. And what we're doing is having the conversations we need to have. Is it difficult, a conversation? Sure it is. But I can almost bet you that at most tables in this city, they've had this conversation in a continuing to discuss it and it's been a wonderful thing not only to protest but there are movement and organizations the city itself is um, making some moves toward ever being ever inclusive discussions with the police have been going forward um, groups are forming youth are activated they get it and it's absolutely been wonderful thank you thank you and Keiko I'm wondering what you see happening right now in response uh, to Black Lives Matter and, and all the issues that it's raising. Yeah, I think it's, I, I echo what Anthony said. It's really uh, just a kind of a wonderful time in our community's life too, where you see 
uh, this energy and this education uh, kind of passing virally between people. Um, you see the youth really um, energized and rising up. I have uh, three of my four children are involved in separate um, but, you know, aligned efforts to bring racial justice to the table. And it's, and it's just really, um, it's very, very cool to see them engaging, to learning about the civic process, uh, you know, and, and all of the education, because it's not just the marches, right? It's, it's moving that toward actual policy. And, um, and that's the journey they're on. So it's, it's really, uh, you, obviously there's some pushback, but, uh, you know, for the most part, I think that there has also been really kind of a, a celebration of, of this sort of exploding awareness about black lives and brown lives. You know, Keiko, I just want to say uh, um, that I've met a number of your, of your, uh, your children, and they are fine leaders. And I'm happy Thank to you. be led by them. They're, they're Thank incredible. You. Yeah. So, um, so Leslie, I just wonder what you're seeing happening right now and, and uh, from your perspective. Well, I guess I'm seeing the, the you know, some, some of the fallout is here locally, but also, you know, hooray on a national level, our Washington football team has decided that their yeah. race name yeah. could go away, finally. And so I, I think there's just this groundswell of enthusiasm and um, an opportunity to create change. So I, that's what mostly excites me. That's great. And Kate, I know you, you were one of the, one of the young adult leaders um, who helped to get the, um, uh, some of the, the, the public protests going in the first place. And, and I really, we're really all very thankful for your leadership, but kind of what do you see happening from your, from your vantage point? Um, well, really, it started when the protests were picking up in Seattle. Um, I was on the phone with a friend who lives in LA, and I was saying, hmm, maybe I should drive to Seattle. And at that moment, I got a text from a friend saying, hey, I'm going to be at 12th and Commercial. And honestly, it was kind of a radical moment for me, having moved back home and realizing that even in my own mind, I've been doing a lot of activism work in other cities that I've lived in, but that I had even exported my activism to the nearest metropolis. Um, so it's been really wonderful. And honestly, I felt the most like I've belonged in this town um, in, these, in these past six weeks through this type of work. So it's been really exciting um, to be a part of these conversations and to have the opportunity to uh, meet and learn from y'all. Well, Kate, I just want to say that it was such a beautiful thing because my wife and I were, were texting with folk uh, who were leaders in Seattle um, trying to figure out if we should head down there. And then, and then I think Cheryl was the one that found out about it on Facebook. And so it was just so great, you know, to have this opportunity to go and, and still wear masks, still social distance, you know, and do all those appropriate things to take care of each other. But I just really deeply appreciate the leadership of all of the, all of you who helped get that initial uh, conversation going down there on 12th and Commercial. So it's just been great. So as as we now like talk about like what are some of the changes that need to be made in the institutions um, within within Anacortes or on, on Fidalgo Island uh, to increase equity and diversity, um, Keiko, I'd like to start with you if I could. Yeah, well, my focus, um, although I don't speak for the district, it, it definitely is the focus of my attention. And, you know, I'm also a parent in the district and, and uh, have raised children through the school, through the school system here. And, and so I feel critically and passionately that, um, the, that the primary institution of learning about racial justice should be our district. And we should be a beacon of light in that regard. Um, and, you know, uh, institutions by their nature are, are you know, um, conservative. And I don't mean that in a political sense. I simply mean that in, in um, a conservation sense, maybe, of, of you know, um, not moving fast. But I think, you know, you also see with COVID and you see with the, um, you know, the, the monuments, the... Um, action around monuments. You see it with the Washington Redskins where 
suddenly the things that we 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 were told were impossible suddenly they're they're possible right like suddenly there are resources suddenly there's a way uh you know when when the need rises um so do solutions and so i see this opportunity with the district to really turn its attention in very meaningful ways toward its own recently adopted policy about equity and um and to lean into that unknown um but to do it with all alacrity and intention so that that's um you know focus um right now is to uh really put fire into that conversation of what does that mean and what does that mean not five years from now what does that mean today right today so leslie i'm interested in knowing what what are some of the institutional changes that you think might might need to happen here uh, for all of us to to increase diversity and equity well for sure i i will just you know lead off with this since time immemorial curriculum that there there is this mandate for districts to engage in their local with their local tribal governments to get that history accurate and actually disseminated i mean i think that's the important thing is to have movement from beyond the planning phases of it but to actually get it get it down and get it um agreed upon and negotiated and then articulated and shared so for me, just just bringing that years long project to fruition would really be amazing. Right. Thank you. Thank you. And, and Kate, from your perspective, what do you think needs to change in terms of some of the institutions uh, in, in Anacortes? Well, um, I graduated from AHS in 2005, so I also feel like I can't really speak to the current state for what students are experiencing right now in the school district. Um, but I can say that um, within the schools and beyond, within the city of Anacortes, I, I feel like um, in general, the perspective about discussing equity and justice um, needs to be treated just as a fact as compared to a political um, divisive subject. And, and I feel like if there's a way that we can talk about that through addressing our history and our present tense in a way that isn't polarizing, but really just kind of matter of fact, um, rational, um, and with empathy as compared to it being something that leaves somebody out or to me, um, I just, I feel like we're at that, that point where it really needs to just become something that we can all address without feeling that somebody's being attacked or left out. You know, I, I really resonate with that, you know, Kate, and I'll just share for, for myself, uh, you know, there's, we, we have some aspirational values uh, around liberty and justice for all people, all people, you know, endowed with certain alienable rights. And we know that those values, those kind of constitutional values um, are, have never been lived out fully, right? We, we know that they, they're, they're aspirational but 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 striving for a more perfect union of of, of all of those citizens of all those rights it, it shouldn't be something that divides us rather that it is a fulfillment of 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 some values that have never been lived out fully and i just i feel like so often you're right kate it just gets blown into some kind of us versus them sort of uh political conversation instead of it being the fulfillment of, of values that were, st that were stated and that we've never quite lived up to yet and that we all long to live up to. Um, so Anthony, how about you? What, what are some of the, the structural you know, changes and in institutions that need to happen here to further equity and diversity here? Coming from the South and coming from having grown up in segregation, integration, um, so much of uh, the structures that were in place not only psychologically, but economically, socially, um, all of the structures, the systematic racism and indifference to people of color. You know, so finding a way to walk across those balance beams, having come from nothing, uh, wonderful parents, hardworking, but coming from that to where we are now, living in Anacortes, being a part of it, 
in the in the uh, echelons and enjoying every single moment. But what also is clear to me is that we need to have this discussion as a society, truly for us to join forces together, the good of diversity. You know, there are questions we're not asking one another that we want to know that we don't understand, pretending as if we know. And so in order for truth to come forward and people to really resonate with one another, to connect at a deeper level rather than surfacely, we have to have that conversation. And this is what's happening now. Our city is having this conversation. Individual homes, uh, the marches that have been so wonderfully orchestrated and, and by our youth, very clearly bringing so many people to the table, the horns of the people that are not there on the sidewalk, but trumpeting their horns in support all carries a message. It carries a message that the conversation is being had. So if we have this conversation, if we can adequately teach, because it, these are unteachable moments, then therefore good hearts can never be the same. And the good heart allows us to talk about inclusion at a different level. For those that may just be awaking to the reality of life for, you know, so many people of color is that it is heartfelt and wonderful. So I'm saying structurally, inclusion, whether that's boards, whether that's having a say, the school system is one wonderful place that we can truly prepare our kids for the real world that's out there. And the real world is less than 15 miles away. But then also inclusively, whether that's in jobs, opportunity, education support, we have mechanisms here that we need to have those conversations with as well, such that we can all move forward together. Thank you, Anthony. And I, I, I know some of the issues that we've all, you know, talked about, you know, so far, now one of them has been about like sort of the, the curricula, the history curricula at Anacortes High School. And, and Kate, you mentioned that you graduated in 2005. And I'd be curious for you to kind of think back for a minute about what was the basic story of, of human history on this continent, you know, that you, that you got as a, as a student of Anacortes uh, Elementary and Middle School and High School. So what was, what was the nugget of that story? Well, we def definitely didn't have a sense time Im immemorial curriculum. Um, and I, um, I would say essentially the manifest destiny story was the core of what our history was based around and how it was taught. And um, I was trying to think about specific memories that I had in relationship to those lessons. And what stands out to me is, is more in middle school than in high school, because I think by high school, really, I just kind of felt in some ways disappointed. <laughs> and so just found my places that I could exist in. And there were some safe spaces there. And I know that there are new teachers as well. Um, in high school, I spent a lot of time like in the drama department and that was like my safe place. Um, but uh, in, in middle school, specifically um, in our uh, history class, um, we did kind of a reenactment of like a colony situation. And I remember that my role was like the land surveyor. <laughs> And the fact that I had no critical thought about my role in this simulation, which uh, was completed with a visit to the seat of our colonization in this country, to, with a visit to Washington, D.C., all of that without any critical thought, um, to me, speaks a lot about... Um, in you know what what I was what my takeaway was so I guess um I can't give you like specific details about you know all of the the history but uh I de definitely in terms of talking about like slavery in the U.S. it was very much treated as discussing as discussing a trade and an economy as compared to human lives um so um I do have one memory and I'll just quickly share is that there, there was an artist um, who came to perform 
um, when I was in middle school, Kurt Lampkin, who's a beautiful musician, an African-American man um, who plays the Chora. And um, he speaks about uh, being in a home, I think that had bricks being thrown through it. And um, it, uh, there must have been some good funding at that moment to bring him in. I saw him a few times and I have one very specific memory of after he performed, um, some students asking if they could um, touch his dreadlocks. And he was so gracious with them and the students were really just curious. There wasn't any sense of, uh, you know, othering or it was really just curiosity. But I remember in that moment watching and feeling uncomfortable, but not being able to articulate why I felt uncomfortable. And um, from the, these opportunities with these protests, being able to speak with folks, you know, 10 years younger than me who are more, who are coming out of the high school now, there's a much higher level of sophistication about all of these um, issues that I was encountering as a young person. So I do see a big difference already, um, which makes me optimistic for there being more change because they're the ones that are also pushing for that in the curricula. And so, and so Kate, I'm just going to lean in just one more minute here with you. Um, but so when you went, when you went to college or when you left Anacortes, like, did you feel, you know, how did that telling of history prepare or not prepare you for, for kind of the, the world that you were encountering out there? Um, I will say that I, I was fortunate in that I did get to live in multicultural settings before because my parents were teachers and they got grants to teach abroad for a couple times in my upbringing. So I got to live in a Muslim country for a year. Um, mm -hmm. And so I, I had a little bit of that, but the cognitive dissonance of coming home still hadn't really like settled in. And so when I went to college, um, I had a professor, Erica Lord, who's an amazing artist with Athabascan heritage. Um, she did a lot, she does a lot of really interesting work about like critical attitudes about race and also her identity. Um, and she had us read a lot about just simply the fact that uh, whiteness is an identity which is something that I had never considered before, that I had always been taught that it was sort of the baseline that everything else varied from. Um, and so that to me was a, was a big moment, but still even being in a school like Evergreen that is kind of like a bubble, um, I had to move on to live in Washington DC and then to San Diego to keep encountering um, all of these lessons, with, which today I'm, I'm still, so um, I guess, yeah, I, I think there were a lot of moments when when leaving Anacortes that were eye-opening, um, and I feel fortunate that I got to be exposed to some of them, um, which obviously continues. Thank you, Kate, and I really appreciate you sharing your experience there, and I, I'd be interested, Keiko, to see if you have any thoughts about Kate's experience and about the curricula in general, like how far has, are, what is the curricula like right now, and what needs to change about it? Well, I've been having some uh, interesting conversations about that. And, and well, I'll tell you, um, you know, this uh, comes from one of the petition signers. And, and so there is a petition, um, solicitors know, that was started to uh, address the history curriculum in the, in the school district and um, infuse it with an anti-racist, multicultural um, you know, multi-voice perspective, which it doesn't have right now. Um, one of the signers, and there have been several teachers who have signed on, and one of the signers said, you know, I have the same textbooks, I'm using the same textbooks that I did when I was a student at Anacortes High School, like in the 90s or something. It's still, it's, it's the same book. Um, and so there, you know, it's access to texts and materials, but it's also questions about how one teaches, uh, you know, what, what are the methods of inquiry that are used and, um, and just really preparing teachers for that inquiry as well. And it's not just history, it's, you know, how do you, uh, how does, how do anti-racist um, perspectives, uh, how do they impact how math is taught? or science, or music, or drama, it, you know, it kind of doesn't matter what the subject is um, when you're talking about um, 
that, uh, you know, method of imparting ideas to our young, is that through an anti-racist lens or is it through a white centered lens? And I think that, you know, as it stands right now, uh, because there hasn't been a, an opportunity for teachers to engage in what is anti-racist teaching, the default is for every district across the country is going to be a white-centered curriculum, a white-centered um, perspective on teaching, white-centered uh, ideas about achievement, about testing, um, you know, about classroom design. It doesn't matter what it is. It's all very much um, taught toward uh, the status quo, which is, of course is what I grew up in too. Um, so, you know, absolutely that push toward uh, new materials with that critical perspective on, on race, gender, all of it um, is long overdue. Uh, and I think this is the moment to say, this is, you know, this is the education our children need to go out into the, not just to go out into the world, to live in Anacortes, they need this, right? <laughs> just to be in the world, period. Um, you know, they need this absolute um, uh, just re-envisioning of what the, the values and the outcomes of education should be in this country. You know, it doesn't, it doesn't, um, it doesn't harm anyone to recognize that, like, for instance, algebra was, is, a, is an Arabic word, right? Algebra was created by, by a Muslim, <laughs> right? That, 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 that is not, that is not, that, that actually helps us to see the, 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 the incredible diversity and the contributions of many peoples and many cultures around the, mm -hmm. around the world, right? Um, let's see, I'm just wondering like what you heard in Kate's uh, sort of experience and, and, and what you kind of hope that we can get to in terms of the way that we're talking about history in this town. I think what I, what really stood out for me, Kate, in hearing you talk about what your experience was, it, it, it resonates with my recollection of having had discussions with the district for a very long time about trying to get something going and, um, you know, they're, they're it just being kind of in fits and starts and not ever getting enough momentum to have like a unified cohesive uh, result. And, and so it, it's like really Samish and art history kind of didn't really exist for you, um, basically is kind of the bottom line. And, and I'm just sad for that because there's, there's a lot of story to be told. And I think just as Anthony and other people have said, you know, we're all enriched by the information of learning something new. And, um, you know, there's, and, and not just with history, but I would say there's indi indigenous methods of, of doing science as well. And so there, there's really good textbooks out there that are fairly classic. They themselves are close to 20 years old. And, um, you know, I can rattle off a number of them that I know through my relationship of folks at Northwest Indian College, and they do indigenous science there. And uh, I just, um, I, I think all of the things that I know my ancestors were able to accomplish without a written system, they still had to use math, they had to use science, they had to use um, physics to make things work. And they had other ways of factoring that and figuring it out, but it's still another way of learning that's valid and um, real, so. You know, you know so I, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna just gonna you know, pivot here and we'll have more time, you know, obviously to hear from you, Anthony, but um, I, I'm wondering, um, you know, there, there is this, this, uh, this petition that's been out there um, what's the name of the petition and, and where can people go to, to sign on to that? Does anybody have that with them? Yeah, so the petition is called um, Decolonize the Anacortes School District's uh, Curriculum. And it is online. Um, it's on change.org. Um, but it's also um, on Facebook. It's been shared uh, probably over 350 times the last time I, I looked. and um, 
and, and it is open to, you know, anyone to sign on and, and uh, you know, in particular students, former students, community members, parents, staff, um, and really, you know, broadly, because our children will walk out into the world, right? And so even if you're not from the Anacortes community, you want to, I would hope, you would want to um, support the children here being able to function at, um, as change makers in our world at large. And so it is open to anyone to sign. Um, and, you know, the hope is to present it to the district. Um, it's, it's not my petition. It's actually my daughter's petition. Um, and so she is working to present that to um, district administration in the near future to um, secure a firm commitment to uh, change. That's great. And I just wanted to say um, that, that we're posting that link on our Facebook page. It's also on our Zoom webinar as well. So when we're all done here, please click on that and consider signing it and just, just check it out. Um, so I, I want to share uh, just for a few minutes uh, something that just, um, that just kind of came up. Um, and uh, to, to my awareness in the last week or so, and and it's a, a kind of a mural and art project at the Ann Cortis High School. And so I'm gonna share my screen, everybody here. And if you're watching on a, if you're listening on a podcast, this isn't gonna work too well for you, but I'll, I'll try to narrate it a little bit. And, uh, and and so we're just gonna show a few few photos here. And uh, um, let's make sure that that's showing right. And uh, so it, it sort of begins with this quote, in the spirit of unity, we are guided by our ancestors. And yet, as I look at the photo, um, I'm seeing primarily history that maybe started around 1877 or something like that, or, or just soon after that, uh, 1880s, 1890. And I, I don't see much in there about, about any ancestors of ours who lived on these islands before. Um, and again, as you as I kind of go through the photos, there's a few places where there there seems to be some people of color, not in these particular photos, but but there's not very many. And and history seems to again have started around 1890, you know, uh, some somewhere in there. Um, this is of course uh, the, the what's what's the old high school um, here. A photo of that. Another another story. Another quote here is our story the yardstick by which to measure the blessings we enjoy. And again, I, I keep wondering as I look at these, at these photos over the last, last week or so, um, who's the we? Who is the we that's being spoken of here? Um, is, it, is, it, is it everyone or is it just a, a more narrow sort of vision of we? And then this just completely blew my mind, to be quite honest, is this quote, that, which is at the end. Um, of a beautiful display, like it's it's a it's a well done piece of art, uh, you know, in, in many respects. But uh, we live our lives by what we choose to see, and yet and yet there is a lot in in which there there's a lot of 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 I don't know whether it's intentional choice or not, but there, there's a lot of things that, that we've chosen not to see as a part of education on Fidalgo Island as if education only began uh, when, when the first high school uh, was, was placed here. I, and so I, I, I wanna show you another photo, kind of a historical photo of John Gast from 1872. This is a pretty famous photo uh, depicting the spirit of Columbus, uh, Columbia, uh, coming across the country. Uh, and in her, in her left hand, right hand is an education book. And, and coiled underneath that is a telegraph, or as I like to say, that's the Comcast cable person of the day. And what we see in this, in this, in this painting is, is really manifest destiny. We're, we're seeing a, a, you know, light to the, to the east, uh, trains and uh, boats and cities and farming. And to the left, to the west, we see more gloom and we see uh, indigenous peoples uh, retreating. We see uh, wild animals retreating. And, uh, and, and it's, it to me is a very sad, and, and what I saw on this mural isn't so different, honestly, than this. And, uh, and, that, and that was disturbing to me to see that, that, to see that. So 
I'd be interested to hear, uh, friends, um, you know, kind of how you all respond to this mural and, and, uh, um, and, and what, what is it, you know, what, what are, what are, what are students missing when they, when they see this mural? And Keiko, I'd like to start with you. Yeah, I'd love to talk about the mural. And <laughs> I want to say that, you know, this discussion is not a criticism of the artist. Um, mm -hmm. It is a criticism of the process. Who was, who was at the table, what questions were asked about history. It is not a criticism of the artist. If you looked at the mural as a whole, it is, it's very beautiful. And um, our family's history is represented in artifacts that are part of this, this wall. Um, so I think that, uh, you know, the intent was to celebrate education and community in Anacortes. But again, there's that question of who is the we, right? And so when you look at this mural, it is a celebration in the end of whiteness. And you could say, well, that's because Anacortes is mostly white. And yet the children who attend Anacortes High School, the kids of color every day have to walk past a wall in which they are not represented pretty much at all. Like it's 0.01% uh, maybe um, that's up there. And, and so, you know, for me, that question of, representation and the stories we tell and what's really interesting about the mural and I don't know I'm assuming the artist was not really cognizant of this at the time is that you go through this mural where no one is present except white people um, and yet the end quote that we tell our stories um, by or, or you know what we choose to see what is interesting about that particular pain is that it is filled with um, uh, well-known figures of color. So I think Muhammad Ali is there. Billy Holiday is there. There's a woman in, you know, a hijab that's there. And yet these are not figures, you know, that I, I don't understand. I, I, I puzzle over that. Like, how can we claim those stories as ours? Billy Holiday's story, you know, Muhammad Ali, how, how does that wall reflect their truths. It doesn't, and yet they're claimed at the end as if they are part of the outcome of, you know, education in, in, as it exists and community as it exists in this town. So it's really interesting. It's a question about appropriation. It's a question about, you know, symbolism and representation. And, and um, so, you know, again, the process, I think, um, it was a flawed process and in the end it can only be celebrated if all you want to celebrate is whiteness in this town. So you know I just want to throw in one more um, question for the community is okay what do we do about this like you know it's one thing to talk about confederate statues that you know were put up in the 70s or the 60s at least there is a distance of 40 years or you know 50 to 60 years, but what do you do about something that is present day, that it was celebrated by the, the school community, by the wider community as being a beautiful representation? What do you do about that? Um, how do you address that? How do you make reparations for that? Those are open questions, but I think we have to grapple with them. You know, so, so Anthony, I just would, would ask you to share any reflections you might have there, and then I want to I want to ask Leslie how she feels. Well, you know, thank you, Terry. Um, Keiko, um, Kate, Leslie, uh, the audience, I honestly, genuinely believe that the intent was wonderful, honorable, even though in reality we do recognize that there's a part of our society that deliberately wants to keep the focus singularly on what's called white America. I really just struggle with that concept because, <laughs> you know, but anyway, they want to focus there, but largely I believe the intent was good. But what it also shows in this good intending depiction of, of light covering and illuminating darkness, it tells one side of a story. It's a one story, one-sided story rather than the truth about what we've all been, whether it's native history on this land for thousands of years, 
whether it's the culture that were brought in to do work, whether it was Asians that were brought in here, African Americans that were brought in, people of diverse hues that were brought in. What we had was people trying to tell a story they didn't fully get. Now, the opportunity we have right now is redefining that story, being inclusive like we've never been before. Or we can talk about continuing the same process that we know is not true. Columbus did not find America, unless you want to finish it and say he found it for European Americans, but there were people here for thousands of years. Mm -hmm. I mean, just since the beginning. And there were other cultures that had came through in trade. So the truth about who we are, what we are, how we got here, is the beauty of opportunity before us now in the system, in not only our beloved hometown of Anacorda, criticizing uh, so much as to what we have now, what we are illuminating is the possibility of truly what we can be and telling a story that really helps all of us understand the contributions. And as Leslie said, not only the mathematics, the environmental science that were put in, that people were not ignorant, that they were really brilliant people that have done magnificent things to make the country what it is. We're just pushing to tell the true story such that all of our kids, regardless of understand that the people that they will choose as their friendships, loves, and be around, that they choose them based upon the character of who they are rather than the skin type. And so what we're pushing against is that notion and that depiction that really may not have placed very much value on indigenous culture up until now. And what, you know, other cultures that have done hard work here. There are some Asian families that have been here for four generations. And so what I'm saying is we're ha we want to have the discussion, not to eliminate anybody, but to be ever inclusive of the truth. And that's the best thing we can do for our students and the people living here, because the truth is when they leave this island, there's a huge world out there that they will, we will be woefully unprepared to meet head on, even though academically, meaning from books, that they may be good. So hence the change that we're suggesting is that we began with teaching a true history. And even in the middle of COVID, we believe that it can be done. It is not such a huge lift. And there's no excuse for finding additional reasons to continue with the lie, because it is a lie. Well, you know, the, so, so two things about this, and I think they're really important. And, and I've learned in, in, in the work that I've done around race and racism and my own racism is the difference between intent and impact. My intent may be just totally good, but the impact of my statements or my actions may be really detrimental to my, to my siblings. And so it, it's not about questioning people's in, in, intent. It's about, it's, about, it's about us beginning to question the impact that our words and statements and actions have. The other piece to this is, is I, I was looking at lots of quotes about history, and I didn't find the one I wanted. Um, and so I made one up, which is that the history we tell and the history we omit reveals who we value and who we don't. Yes. Superbly said. And, and, and that's the pain that I see in that mural, yeah. is who we're valuing and who we don't. Right. And so, Leslie, I just want to ask, like, what, what message or what impact does a mural like that or the curricula that we've been talking about, what impact does that have, you know, on, on you as a, as a citizen of the Samish nation? I appreciate the opportunity to speak to this. And I, I do recall when the tribe was actually invited to give some input. But I think part of the part of the issue that, that's happened is I think, it, um, number one, it's a visually lovely display. I don't think anyone can argue with the aesthetic value of it. 
And, and my perspective is that it was carefully um, uh, curated, if that's the word that somebody would use to, to try and find some, you know, real photographs, real artifacts, real, you know, examples. And for our people, prior to the invention of photography in the late 1800s, there were no photographs of Samish prior to colonization. There are, however, good imagery of in the late 1700s about our people greeting the first Spanish ships that came through the Guimas Channel. And we do have access and rights to use some of those um, drawings. And I wanna say that you know, we made that known that that was a choice, but the choice to not include them was really, I think that's the part that that's disturbing to me because it paints that picture that history began with the settlers and that there was no history prior to that. And all of our, all of our traditions, all of our oral tradition and our creation stories have us coming from here. They're serrated bison bones from, Orcas Island that have been carbon dated to, you know, 13,000 years ago. So when you're talking about when, when we say since time immemorial, we really mean that. We disagree with the theory of the land bridge and um, that, you know, there may be r relatives there, but we still say we came from this place. Um, and, and then when you look at other absence basically of Samish and iconic imagery like Maiden of Deception Pass and our seminal story that kind of defines who we are as the giving people comes from that story. That it's something that so many of our young people participate annually in ceremonies around that and that's part of our identity. So I have a 10 year old that's here in this district she's not going to see any part of herself reflected on that mural whatsoever. It's as if Samish didn't even really exist. So, so for me, that, that's, um, you know, a big disappointment. Uh, and, and when I hear questions about, you know, what do we do? I don't know that we can slap a stamp on top of it and add some new images or something. I'm just not really sure you know, where you go with that, because it, it is artwork that depicted a person's vision, but let's not be limited. Let's, let's look at where's there other opportunities for representation to be there. And, and even if we are 7% of the population nationwide and probably less than that here in the city of Anacortes, um, in terms of native communities and such, uh, it's still, we're a tribal government that's right here in downtown. And this is our headquarters for over 2000 citizens. So it, it's important, I think, that everybody recognize that we're here, we've always been here and we plan on staying. So, uh, and, and we're, we consider ourselves really proud and generous people about what oh, yeah. we have to share. Can I add one thing to that, Leslie? You sort of, I always love hearing uh, stories and uh, how about the Samish people in particular, in their watching as they willingly participate in almost every turn when someone comes and asks here in Anacortes, Samish Indian nation joins as good citizens and good people, you know, which is really their spirit coming forward. One of the challenges that, one of the reasons why the cultural coalition, the ideal group we formed, Part of the, the, the genesis of pulling together a group of people that will begin to address um, this issue of education. Um, you know, one of the reasons why on that committee we not only have a Leslie, which is, you know, of course, um, a citizen of the Sandwich Indian Nation, but we also have um, uh, Keiko, which is also, you know, culturally ingrained in this town, multi-ethnic or children, you know, beautiful, very much organized. And we also have an African-American woman of Jamie, Jamie Woodards, that's there. We have Caucasians that are there. The benefit of that is that we have people who are steeped and rooted in culture 
that are willing to step up and say, how can we help? How can we help get there as soon as possible, but as reasonably as possible and as accurately as possible to help us begin this year? So that gives a panoramic view in a beginning conversation of culture. And we believe that that is a strong representation to begin a conversation where action can take place rather than a perpetual putting off. Where you hold your priorities is where you put your budgets as well. So I think that that's, that starts to shift us a little bit toward what are some of the things that we can be doing moving forward, you know, to, to positively, you know, enlarge, enlarge the we so that, so that all of the beautiful folk who've lived here since time immemorial and who live here now can be represented and honored and their contributions you know, brought forward as the gifts that they are. And we had a couple of great comments you know, on Facebook tonight. I mean, one was, would it be possible for the museum maybe to do sort of an audio journal and podcast of people of, of color in Anacortes and some of their stories? Um, and and that, that's just a beautiful, a beautiful idea. And then also another person was commenting, saying that, that you know, we have a sister cities group but do we have a, a committee or a group, group of folk who organize sort of a, a cross-cultural uh, events you know, here in, uh, in Anacortes to promote cultural awareness and with art, through art installations and so forth? And, and those, are, those are beautiful ideas, but I'd be interested to know, uh, Kate, if you have any ideas of things that we could do to kind of move forward. And in our eight minutes or so, let's each share about a minute of what we, what we think we might, might be able to do positively going forward. Um, well, I think that whether you're a teenager or a senior in this town, I hope that we can keep building ways for people to engage in stories and educational opportunities, um, to just keep exposing people to new ideas and to more of a sense of grounding to all of the lives that have lived and shaped life in this town and so what i'm hoping is we can just find keep finding ways to build in public programming for that so i i do have faith that um students will you know start to having a more decolonized curriculum and i want our seniors to also have exposure to that as well um as well as families um so that's what i'm i'm hoping that we can work on whether it Keiko, be I'd be interested to hear from you. Oh, sorry. Oh, no, just whether it be through art events or, you know, concerts. It doesn't all have to be, you know, painful uh, moments of, it, there's so many ways that this can take place for it, for it to be really joyful as well. Thank you. Thank you, Kate. And Keiko, how about you? What do you think we could be doing moving forward? Yeah, well, I think specifically about the wall, um, I mean, it's standing. I don't know what its fate will be. You know, I will continue to push for um, dialogue about it. But, you know, absent its removal, I think, you know, what I really want from that wall is just academic honesty, like just at least at very least a discussion um, that is led for the students in the community that points out the fact that, I mean, it, in a sense, it is a correct wall. It is a, absolutely a celebration of, you know, whiteness, white education. You can't say it's wrong, but then you have to ask those questions. Where are the native children? Where are the Chinese children? Like, where are they? You know, they're not there. Where are the black children? They're not there. Then you have to ask that question. Why aren't they there? You know, so, so yet the wall could stand, I guess, in a weird way, it's right, but then you have to ask that question about absence. And so I would love to see the, the school district and the high school engage in that kind of academic honesty, because that is what they should be standing for, is academic honesty. Um, the other thing I just want to say for just the community at large, too, and this isn't specifically our topic tonight, but this does has, have to do with education is, um, you know, just really I encourage people to think of this work and think of, um, you know, this uh, push to educate oneself to spread knowledge 
it just always start with yourself, right? Like we all carry bias, we all carry racism. Um, I think it's most discouraging when I see people trying to check other people's racism, but really you need to bring it home. You need to bring it home. You need to have the, you know, the, those painful discussions with yourself and, you know, stop worrying about other folks. <laughs> They'll, they'll take, you know, they're on their own journey, but we are each on our separate journeys. And I just really encourage, especially white folks, to, to uh, do that painful work by, uh, of your own and by yourself. Um, and you will be so much more powerful once you've done that. Um, instead of jumping, and that, that is a white thing to do, right? To jump five steps ahead and now, and now we're all experts. But you really need to put yourself back in a beginner's position and be comfortable there and know that that's where you, that's where you're most powerful is just having that beginner's mind that, you know, they talk about in Zen Buddhism, always learning, always starting over. Thank you, Leslie. I'm interested to hear what you have to say about what, what, what can be done moving forward uh, around all of these issues of history and storytelling. Hmm. Well, and, and I'm just going to tap one more thing onto something Kate said earlier about being asked to play a role, because I know in, in like maybe a decade or so ago, work with the school district on, you know, some of those baby steps of trying to work through since time immemorial, there was talk about teachers wanting the children to, you know, like, okay, we're going to have like this, these are going to be the kids who are going to be native. And these are going to be the kids who are going to be the settlers and stuff. And, you know, from my perspective, boy, you, you can be a scientist, or you can be a doctor, or you can be president of the United States, but you can't be native if you're not. And so trying to like try on a role and dress up like that is just, if, if, there, if nothing else, if we can scratch that off the list of an acceptable technique to use with kids, that we're not gonna adopt the persona of someone else because we have to do our own work. Like exactly like what Keiko was saying, each and every one of us has our own bit of work to do. And we can't, I can't imagine what it's like. I mean, I, I can imagine, but I can't be African American. I'm not. And so uh, the same with Asian American. I, I only have what I am, which is a mixture. Um, and uh, and I think, I think that's it, is in a nutshell, trying to get down to how, how do we deal with ourselves? And then um, I'll do one more quote from our late chairman. Um, Ken Hansen used to say many, many, many years ago when Samish was getting opposed all the time all over the place, that some people want to draw a circle that leaves us out. And what we're going to do is we're going to draw a circle that's bigger puts everybody in. And I think that's, that's what we're trying to do here is get the circle bigger. Thank you so much, Leslie. And Anthony, you got about one minute. Hey, thank you, Terry. And uh, I appreciate you giving me my time. <laughs> I'm, I'm somewhat loquacious because I honestly believe that there's a lot to be said because you're trying to give so much information in a short period of time because guess what? These are conversations we've been long needing to have part of our soul has always wanted to have this conversation of all cultures and hues. So, but the thing that's so important for me right now is we continue to listen. So I'm challenging all of you out there to, to listen, to try to understand what the angst is, the, 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 the anger, the, the fear, and that's to listen to one another. So one of the things that I'm hoping we do, not only as a cultural, ideal group, but also as other organizations within our youth, Kate, the teams, that we begin to have the conversations. Part of what I'm hoping that goes forward is I'm going to suggest a movie which is really dealing with the reconstruction period. Not only reconstruction, but that eight-year period where there was far more integration, that there were successes that led to what was the Tulsa riot, whether um, Durham, North Carolina being uh, also another Black Wall Street, um, and the fear that came out of that and the burning and the looting, but 
there was an eight-year period of reconstruction that was absolutely stunning. So what I hope to do is part of the ideal group, we push that forward, and then we have a sort of Zoom town hall meeting about it. We want to be able to recommend books to book clubs at this point for them to read and then come in and have an online discussion. Because not only do you come away with knowledge, you come away with having the ability to discuss it in a safe environment. There's a rich Native American history, rich Asian American history, rich uh, African American history, rich you know, Irish history. I, I'm 11% Irish. All African Americans here in this country are at least 15% white. Descendants of the very same people many of white America are descended from as well. So, but that's our history. And so how do we tell our collective story? Because America didn't get great on white people alone. It just wasn't. It was either the labor, the force, you know, in, in colonial Williamsburg. I mean, people were dying and the natives were still giving them food and help. We got here together. And the hope in all of this discussion is that we realize that. And so that's just simply the genesis of this push, is not to push anyone away, to not to make anyone feel bad about the truth, but to use the truth to set us free truly and help all of us be able to grow from that. So there, there's a lot of wonderful stuff happening here in the town. We can't wait to tell you about us. Keep listening in, and I guarantee you, you may find something that intrigues you. So I just wanna, wanna say that, uh, you know, I think, um, I think as we begin to tell a story, a, a history that is inclusive of, of all of us here, I, I think we're going to find some moments of pain. A, as I have found, as I've, as I've been confronting my own racism in my life, but, but there's something much deeper and much, much more beautiful that emerges in that, which is that, that I, I, I find as, as I'm letting go of some of that, as I'm recognizing it and making changes, that I'm recognizing not only the humanity of other people, but I'm recognizing my own humanity differently. And so there are moments of pain in this. And I think one of these days we should have a conversation about what, what are some of the, 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 the points of pain that we're likely to experience as we engage this, this broader, deeper, more inclusive story. But I, but I think that that story is going to, to, to light a future that I think is going to be um, more wonderful than we can imagine if we will just endure some moments of pain and recognize the beauty in all of us. So I just want to thank you, Anthony and Keiko and Leslie and Kate. Thank you for being here with us tonight. And thank you all for listening. You can find out more about our work at paths to understanding.org. We have a new podcast that we're just launching. You can find that on Podbean and Apple podcasts called the Paths to understanding podcast. We love to have you uh, listen to that and, and uh, share a, a like and, and maybe review and share it with one friend. We have a, a really big event coming up next week. We're going to have a week of, of, of uh, live webinars um, in our partnership with Holden Village doing Interfaith Week this week. So check out our website and you can find out more about that. And until next time, be well, be calm, and be good to your neighbors. Thank you all for watching. Thank you.